Hello, Dusan. Welcome back or welcome to the podcast. We've talked before, but not on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Georgi. Thank you for uh, having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is one of those um, conversations I was really, really excited for because, um, I mean, I got to know you through your um, social media platform, which is How to Rhino. And it's also a platform that you have, which is to learn how to use Rhino uh, for architectural purposes. And I've been myself a student, or I'm still a student of the platform. And um, good, good. I was really, really impressed um, by the work you have done by building up this platform. And I'm really, really happy to have you on and discover the back stage of the whole story. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for for all of the introduction. Yeah, like we started... We started this, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. It's 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 grown very, you know, fast so far, and it's it's great to to that you actually had a chance to take a look at the content of the platform and see, you know, what we have done. Our main goal is, you know, to help our professional architects to to learn uh, Rhino and Grasshopper and to really use it in a professional way uh, in an architectural office. We think that uh, there's really a big gap between. Uh, the knowledge that our universities give us and then what you actually need to know when you start working uh, professionally. And we're kind of trying to help people to bridge that um, that gap of, of, of knowledge and to really be equipped uh, with with the specific knowledge when they start working. So, yeah, that's, that's our um, main goal. I was really, really impressed uh, when I started the... The course, I, I did the first two modules. If the people go check there at like nine or something like that modules. Yeah, cur currently we have nine, yeah. And um, I, I like to have a lot of guests from Bulgaria and from the Balkan area because I come from there. And uh, when I go there, sometimes there is this misconception that people... Um, mm, not, not, not everyone takes themselves seriously that they can do something world class. And I think that the platform that you have done, it's really world class and it's the perfect fit for people who don't have time, like me, that work full time, have a podcast. And it's the perfect, uh, uh, I call it like a hybrid because you yeah. can you can do like sort of tutorials, but you can also get in touch with you. You can send questions and so on. Um, so this is really, really like what impressed me from the first side of of the from inside the platform but i want to start from the beginning i always like to discover the background of the people that i sure. have on so i don't know your background personally so much um what was the moment in your life that made you d decide you wanted to be a professional architect professional designer creative yeah so i i was lucky enough uh to to take part in um student exchange like it's called uh it was called a smile program for people who are from serbia when we were in uh, high school uh we could actually apply to be a part of this program that was sponsored by american government and uh if we pass through the english tests we could actually spend uh, a year in american school um, and everything would be paid and that happened to me i was i was uh, the one who got chosen and we like all of us, all the students from Serbia uh, went and we lived with American families and we had different kind of like schools, different kind of cities where we're in. And that's where I actually saw like what an educational system looks like. That is not a typical system that I saw in Serbia uh, because uh, in Serbia, in our high schools, we learn a lot of things and even things you don't even need. So it's a lot of text, it's a lot of information. And when I, when I, when I saw the education system in America, I, I saw that they really value solving problems and having um, the information that is really interested specifically for you. So if you want to be more creative, you could go in that direction. If you want to be more into like, you know, cooking, you can go in that direction. You can go in acting. So in high schools, they had all of these like, let's say paths that you can take. And when I was there, when I got there, um, we, we had to kind of choose the subjects, right? Because I was, I was first year in my high school in Serbia. And then in the second year of my high school, I was supposed to be in the States, in America. 
And when I, when I went there and when I talked with the counselor to kind of choose the subjects, they told me, uh, like all of the things you learned in the first year of your high school, are the things that we cover in all, all four years of our high school. So you kind of already went through all of the, the things and now you can kind of choose whatever you want, you know, inside of there. So that's where uh, I was like blown away with the possibilities. And that's where I, I chose the subjects that I never had access to in Serbia. Like I chose to do, for example, ceramics. Um, I was um, going, going into web design and that was like back in 2006. So it was a long time ago. I was like 16 years old. And by just having this opportunity to see like what the education system could, could look like, that's where I kind of got all of that creative energy from. And I remember one day um, uh, we had uh, some kind of um, like uh, like we had to go in on the trip where uh, people from different uh, jobs are going to have their lectures and they would just want you to see as a high school student, what are the possibilities when you grow up and what are all of the, all of the different like fields where you can go in. One of these guys uh, was an architect. Uh, the second one is game designer. And the third one was somebody from economics. So, I went on those, on those lectures and like, also I was involved heavily at that point into video games. So I was thinking that video games is something that I really wanted to kind of go into later on. Uh, but the, just the, the video game was so bad. It was so like, like crap. So I could just like, I decided, okay, this is not for me. I don't like these types of games and I don't think this will, you know, be fun. So the second one was the the guy who finished like economics and they were talking about finances, about like money and so on. And I was like, okay, yeah, maybe, but still not there. And then uh, the architect came and he was, okay, this is my, my daily routine. This is what I do when I go to work. He brought the big, you know, uh, scrolls of paper with all the drawings. He showed those drawings to us. Uh, he had a ruler like here on the, on the, uh, above the ear. And it was like a typical, you know, uh, architect that you would see with the, with the color and everything. And, um, he was so happy and he was so like involved in his talk when, when he talked with, with us. And I was like, yeah, this sounds very interesting. This is maybe something that I wish I want to do later on. And that was the first, like the real inspiration that got me. That's when I decided, okay, that's, that's what I want to do. And then later on, it was just like, I was trying to explore, okay, what is my next step? How do I get inside the best school possible? Right. And that was, that was the, the initial like step to, to go into this direction. In, in which city in the U S did you, did you end up going? It was a very small city. It has around, I think 5,000 people. Uh, it's called Vermilion in South Dakota. And it, it's like in the middle, middle part of, of the States. And, you know, I had a chance to, you know, uh, meet, meet, uh, you know, their culture to understand their, you know, points of view. It was very, uh, very, um, good experience for me to develop to let later on as a person and just to see different cultures at very young age. Yeah, totally. I can, I, I couldn't agree more. And, uh, I can relate a little bit because I studied in a school of arts in Rome and because oh. in high school in Italy, you have a lot of options. You can go, with uh, linguistics, you can go more when scientific school, and I was really more into both things. So I went with art, and there we had also ceramics, sculptures, painting the first two years, and then you could decide a path. And I chose uh, back in the days was called um, architecture and interior design, and then then I went with the university and so on. And what mm -hmm. was your mm -hmm. first, uh, your further um, education? Did you study in Serbia or did you study abroad? Yeah. So, so, so later on, uh, like since that day, I started to look at the options that, you know, I have in Serbia and the most logical option was to, to go in the best uh, university in Serbia for architecture. And that was uh, the faculty of architecture at university of Belgrade. And since that day, I started to kind of see, you know, how to get in because that's like, that was my next step because in, in, in our faculty, when I was trying to get in, it was very difficult to get in. Uh, and it's not so difficult to finish, but it's very difficult to get in. That's, that's, that's what was when I was a student right now, it's a different, a little bit different story, but, uh, back then, you know, I was trying to find, uh, all of the information I could online about how to get in and what, what was, what was needed on this, on this entry exam. Uh, 
And I found a lot of uh, forums, like design forums from Serbia. I found people who, who, who got into school and I wrote them on forums and I was asking them about these questions about how to get in, what do we need to do and so on. They sent me a lot of um, a lot of like information about like what is really needed when you need to learn how to draw and how to draw and what, like, it's really something that I've never done before. I've never like drawn before artistically and so on. So that year, one year before the entry exam, uh, I chose, um, we have these so-called schools that private schools that prepare you for this entry exam because it's very difficult. And uh, one year before the, the entry exam, I was starting to go in Belgrade here in, in the capital. Uh, I was traveling every single week, 30, uh, three, uh, 350 kilometers from my home city. I was traveling every single week to go through these kind of like preparations. And um, at the end, you know, I learned from knowing how to do nothing, you know, like with uh, pen and paper to really have really cool drawings at the end. And I was... Um, I was lucky enough to get in the, in the faculty in university. I was, um, the thing with, with our university is that it, it was the most expensive university, you know, in the whole country. And, um, uh, the way that our system works is you have, you have, uh, some spaces, which, uh, the, the country is going to pay for, and some are the ones that you need to pay for. So I was, I was like, everybody wanted to be in the first, you know, set of 140 people who got in that don't pay anything and the other set of 100 would need to pay like 3000 euros at that point and that was really really expensive for you know an average family from serbia so yeah that was that was the the next step to get in and luckily that happened as well well that's a cool story i i hear a lot of uh, people in bulgaria told me the same story that it's uh, very hard to get into the architectural faculty but once you get in it's kind of uh, cruise through <laughs> yeah yeah I, I would say like you really need to be really really like not big intention or not caring at all if 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 you want to fail right it's really like at least you need to show up and to have something done but almost everybody you know the, goes through well and um what was the moment then you managed to transition from the academic world to the professional world because this is also a very important step in everybody's career like because as you are said yourself also you didn't come from a family that had architects so yeah um, it's a little bit this is also what the motivation i'm doing this podcast is because i didn't have any connections i didn't know anything um i didn't know how to join the professional world and uh, i didn't have any clarity so that by having conversations with people that are have had different stories and people can get informed themselves what was the case for you how did you find your first job um, i also checked on your linkedin you've been also working abroad for a certain period of time or yeah, am i yeah. wrong yeah. yeah yeah so so in terms of the in terms of the you know transition to the professional uh, field professional um, area like it was really about okay well, what is what is my goal like what i want to do after I, after i graduate and uh, the first initial thoughts that I had, um, were, I really need to get out of the country. That was my, you know, initial, uh, initial thoughts because, uh, I knew that, um, a lot of offices in Serbia either don't hire or they do very boring and repetitive work that you would be, you know, you have to do that at the beginning and, um, they don't pay well or they don't pay at all. So, that was that was like something that I I was I was thinking about. Okay, I need to get out. I need to go. I need to I need to get my professional experience um, outside the country, and uh, I think that it all started with you know first creating a portfolio, having you know a good portfolio. That was my my first step when I graduated, and uh, then it was just like a make a list of all of the offices you would like to apply for, and start sending the the applications. And start sending all you know the cover letters and so on. Um, so the first uh, the first um, internship that I got was um, in Poland, and it turned out to be one of the best decisions in my you know professional life because uh, I really learned a lot there, not just in terms of 
uh, how the office works, but also how you should behave with, you know, with your, with your colleagues, how you should behave professionally with, with the boss, how the business is run, how like you're just, you're a team and you kind of need to work together and like teamwork is very important. And also your personal skills and, and your, uh, professional skills are, are very important. Uh, so that office was, um, uh, K A M J Z by Matze, uh, Maciej Zawadzki, uh, in Poland, in Warsaw. And I had, a, had, a I was kind of lucky enough to, uh, not, to not be alone there because my colleague Lazar was also there with me and his girlfriend, Sofia was also there. And we were all, and also our, our friend from university as well, um, uh, Amayu. Uh, so there, there was four of us from, from uh, my university and we all got the internship in the same office. And that was, that was kind of, you know, a very, very like, uh, interesting because, uh, first, uh, first I, initially I, I got a internship first and then they also applied and, uh, we, we found ourselves all in Warsaw, you know, a couple of months later, and it was really good experience, both again, culturally and, and professionally. And, uh, I think that's the best, that the best way to kind of, you know, uh, learn the, the professional skills is through, through internship first. And that's where all of my skills pretty much were like made, like all of my skills of Rhino and Grasshopper started developing uh, at that office. Um, and slowly then we had, um, after that experience I had, um, I, I was in Italy, in Milan uh, for a couple of months. Uh, I was working for one um, professor uh, in uh, Politecnico di Milano, Giuseppe Di Pascale, for a couple of weeks. And then I was supposed to work for David Chipperfield as well in Milan. But you know how it is, the problems with visas, with working papers. And that's like the biggest uh, pain in my life because when I was, I was a fresh graduate, um, it wasn't just enough that you have good skills to work somewhere. It was about, do you have the visa to work there? And that's a big problem for us. Uh, a lot of my friends got very good jobs uh, in Europe and they just couldn't go there because the company couldn't do the visa for them because we were not in EU. So that that's also like a very, very big challenge. So a lot of my friends either, you know, I went to work abroad, went to work in China, uh, because or went to work in Middle East because that's where we didn't need visa for. And my my path was, you know, I was kind of trying to uh, stay in Europe. And after Milan, I came back to Serbia. That's where I started applying for jobs again. But this time I was searching the offices in Europe again. And then I was suggesting that I may be able to work online because I could not do the visa thing, right? So uh, one of these offices replied positively. It was an um, urban agency company from Denmark. Uh, that's where I um, had a chance to, to work with them remotely. Uh, and that also brought my, my skills to a very high level, again, because they were all doing uh, things in Rhino. Um, so this first office uh, in Poland, they were doing only competitions. And an urban agency from Denmark did like execution projects, projects that are going to get built. And I kind of had both, I know, uh, both types of experiences with products that are, you know, in conceptual phase and then also in projects that are going to get built. Um, and after that, I worked for um, a Serbian company uh, called uh, RMJM uh, in Belgrade. And that's where I had the experience on working on very big project. Uh, we were working on um, Sheremetyevo International Airport in Moscow. And that was really huge because you can see not only like, how to how the project works, but how the communication goes with the clients, how many iterations of designs you have. And it was really hectic because, you know, it's, it's a huge project. There's so many spaces you need to design, so many things you need to change. And um, at that point after that, I decided, okay, now it's time for me to, you know, uh, switch because I, I decided that I don't want to be in that field anymore, you know, because... I, I found out that the lifestyle of an architect was just too hectic for me. It was not something that I, that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And that's how I slowly transitioned to kind of creating something on my own. 
I've uh, seen that in the on the online platform how to Rhino when you subscribe as a student, there are also student this um, bonus classes that are related still to Rhino, but they are um, basically hybrid also like they're not only related to rhino and there is one that i watched and was really interesting it was um from what i understood you work also quite a long time as a freelancer and you were working through this online platforms such as uh, upwork i think was the main upwork, one, yeah. was the main one um did you do this after this uh, big project and how was your personal experience because from what I understood, it was a little bit hard to lead up the whole project, but yeah. uh, then it worked out quite well for you. Uh, in terms of the yeah, in terms of the freelancing, um, it actually started uh, when I graduated. That's that's when I that's when I started doing freelance because up until that point, um, my parents were you know financing my education um, and. Uh, at that time I realized, okay, it's enough. I don't want you to pay for anything else for me. I want to make my own, you know, money. And that's like, I had a friend, um, uh, up to this day who introduced me to freelancing and he showed me the platform. He showed me, um, what it, what, like how it works, how it operates, how you, uh, can make a lot of money from using the skills, you know, already uh, working for international clients. And for me as a student, uh, that was quite like eye-opening because you wouldn't be, you know, stuck uh, directly in a place where you, where you need to work. You can work remotely. And that was back in 2014, uh, something like this. And that's when I first started to explore uh, the freelancing world. I started with Upwork because that was the, back in the day, it, it wasn't called Upwork. It was called Audesk. And then it, it changed the name later on. And uh, an interesting thing about um, Audesk at a time is that you have these kind of uh, tests, software tests that you can do, and you can put these badges on on your pro profile, so people like potential employers can can uh, visit your profile, they can see the badges you have, and then they can you know hire you based on that or based on your portfolio. So I decided, okay, I want to really go into freelancing because I want this to be my side hustle, side job, right? I didn't want this to be like the main thing, but if it grows to be something more, yeah, why not? And um, I did a couple of these tests. I, I filled out my, my portfolio and then it was start, I started applying for jobs. And this is like the hardest thing with freelancing because when you're new, when you your profile doesn't have any feedback from the clients, then it's very difficult to to get uh, new, new uh, employers. So, I started doing, I started experimenting with a lot of, you know, techniques. I started doing some things for free so people can see that I can do them right. So I started um, creating renders, but I didn't send a whole render. I just sent a piece of render so they can see the, you know, the, the ambient and so on. It was a lot of these back and forth, uh, like, like tries. And it was for, I think two or three months, I was trying to get a job and it didn't work. And then, uh, but I knew that it, I have to start somehow, right? And one day it happened. Somebody contacted me, and they wanted to, uh, they wanted some help with with three D. And uh, we started, you know, a project. And the main thing about freelancing is that that first client needs to be very satisfied, so they give you a very good mark. And I was really doing more than I that that I was asked for just to get that good grade at the end, which happened. And then slowly started to grow. I started doing more and more complex products there. And those projects were, I was doing that uh, up until maybe like two years ago. And then I, I just stopped because um, I, I didn't want to put my time in freelancing anymore. But up until that day, like I had proposals from employers all over the world and I did work on very interesting projects. So I did work, for example, even in the field of, you know, graphic design, product design, I was doing, um, uh, um, visualizations. I was doing uh, 3D models. I was uh, preparing models for 3D printing. I was the, the very interesting project I had for even like one and a half year was uh, creating uh, 3D models of um, cars and vehicles that are going to be used in um, in Hollywood movies and series. And that was really interesting project because 
it kind of hit the limits of what I knew in Rhino. And I had to really kind of expand that. And it's really good when you kind of need to push yourself. When you accept something, but you're not 100% sure you know it, but you know that you can get to that point, you know? And that's that's what, what really um, triggered me to have to apply for these new interesting projects. I was designing, you know, cars, spaceships. It was really, really something that I really like personally. So it was kind of, you know, um, hitting two birds with one stone. And uh, after that, I was um, uh, working as a consultant um, for one tech design tech company in the States. And that was the last one. Um, so yeah, that was, that was my story. And I never stopped, I never stopped doing freelance, even when I was doing all of these other, uh, other, you know, jobs, because I wanted to have, um, some kind of money on the side, which is my safe money. So I don't need to rely only on my job. And I really think that this is very beneficial, especially today when, um, you kind of need to depend on your salary only, and you don't have an option B. And that's why a lot of architects, I think, I know personally here in Serbia, a lot of architects just put up with a lot of, you know, a very bad environment in, in, in the office because they just don't have the option B. They know that if they, do, if, if, if they just defend themselves, if they say, okay, I don't want to work overtime, that they will find somebody else who will, and you will lose the job. So for myself, I, I said, okay, like, I, I don't have this fear and and that kind of helped me a lot uh, later on as well. Yeah, I understand. I um, and um, it it's now it gets a little bit more clear about. Um, it's not that it wasn't unclear before, but I I get the background of your approach to building the platform, how to Rhino, and the way it works today. And for me, it was also very very interesting to discover you part and and then now we can talk more about on the process into setting up this whole infrastructure because um i was also very positively impressed and and i'm want to say this openly you're not like i'm paying me for do this podcast or i'm not endorsing you because you ask me it's just sure, my sure. personal sure. opinion and i'm not uh, also, if anyone wants to join your platform, they can feel free. But it's also like I'm not saying that they have to. It's just what I see and what I have experienced. And that is that um, there are a lot of aspects in, in this platform. There are um, the website and then you go in, a, in, in an external platform where you have to log in and it's everything automatized. And then you get all the material and so on. So I'm curious, what was the step one? How did you decide, okay, I want to teach uh, others to learn Rhino? And what was the first step in this idea? Also, from what I understood from the website, you do this together with your friend Lazar. So Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, so before I go to step one, I would go to step zero. Because, you know, prior to this, uh, you cannot just start this without knowing what you're doing. Uh, you have to really think about it first and really have a uh, test idea first before you commit to doing something big. So uh, since, you know, since I was in high school, I was always uh, interested in, in experimenting with some kind of business ideas. I always wanted to have my own business, but I never really got into uh, the faculty for that. And uh I, I actually have two failed businesses before Hot Rhino that I tried and I failed them miserably. And that was pretty much um, what made How to Rhino because if I didn't make those mistakes in the past, then I wouldn't know how to uh, position the platform and position the brand to start with. And um, what were, what was, what were these two things? Yeah. So, the, so, so the first one was um, it was a, uh, it was kind of platform that where you create, uh, where you create uh, some kind of paper, uh, paper elements with um, with. Uh, it, it's very similar to some kind of interior designs where you have triangulated shapes and you can use them as three D puzzles. So you can connect connect them and you can create a form uh, based on the three D puzzles. So you pretty much create a model 
and then you uh, make it all in triangles and then you uh, cut it out with laser and then you connect all these pieces together and then you have some kind of 3d sculpture that you can put on the wall or in the space or wherever and the way that that started was um that was with my with my ex-girlfriend and um we wanted to uh, raise money uh for to, to build this business and uh we chose uh we chose crowdfunding platform called indiegogo and initially i thought okay if you raise enough money then we have enough capital to make this business grow uh, but we didn't raise enough capital at the end i spent a lot of time preparing this this campaign and, and launching this and uh we failed but i learned a lot of lessons along the way uh and some of those lessons were that before you do this kind of thing you kind of need to have the audience you need to have the you need to have somebody who knows you uh and nobody knew that brand at the time and i didn't know anything about marketing that's when i started learning about marketing and uh later on after that failed i moved on and i had another business uh that was about uh, printing uh, t-shirts like printing uh, t-shirts and posters and selling it selling it on, on etsy on on, uh, on the platform and that was the like print on demand business but it also failed because i didn't know how to do uh proper marketing online paid marketing and again creating a brand because i didn't really uh, uh, i didn't really get into these businesses to uh, to help somebody and to solve a particular problem i went into them because they were like interesting and this seemed like a challenge to me so i wanted to take the challenge and really see how yeah, he, if i can you know go forward and after those two failed businesses then i said okay now dushan you're not the smartest person on the on, on the earth you need to kind of listen to the people who went through this before and you need to t- uh, learn uh, from your lessons and then i started also you know reading a lot about finances about marketing about um about creating creating a brand creating a business and the first thing that i realized is okay now i'm not going to start with you know just creating a product first i want to start by seeing if there's product market fit if what i what i have what i know my knowledge of rhino if somebody needs that knowledge because that knowledge really say uh, you know it solves a particular problem uh and then i started creating youtube tutorials uh initially uh there wasn't a lot of people but, but then the channel started to grow and then a lot of people wanted to uh, to know more about you know how they can work with me how they can uh learn rhino more intensively and more like one to one and that's when i got the idea okay now i think is the time to build my emailing list i started building uh you know uh building my emailing list and i started communicating with people um in their inbox because to have to have access to a big amount of people on youtube and on facebook and on instagram is not the same as having a big email list uh, because email list really gives you uh the chance to talk with person one to one and all of these platforms they don't give enough they don't show your post to to the same amount of people they show it to a very small amount of people so uh that's the first thing that i start to to do and then i ask those people those first people okay guys what are you interested in what are your main point, pain points how do you want to like what are the biggest problems you have when you when it comes to learning rhino i got a lot of feedback from them and then i i created the first um the first workshop that was live that was specifically answering those problems that i had and the the workshop went great and then after that uh i i i moved to create the the platform that that you see now uh so creating the platform was was very challenging because it required a lot of pieces of you know of of tech to be integrated together and for somebody who is not in the in the tech it's really difficult to have all of these together so you know i had to learn everything about you know wordpress everything about like web design everything about copywriting because copywriting is also important and then uh everything about you know how you speak with the audience um how do you where do you put all these files like wh- wh- where are the files at right so i took a lot of uh, courses that helped me to gain this knowledge and at the beginning i didn't have enough funds to kind of pay this so that everybody else can kind of just build this for me i had to build everything myself and i had to 
decide every single day in which direction this platform is going to take. And it turned out to be, you know, quite good uh, where I'm happy with it because the platform is something that I really uh, wish that I had when I was learning. That's the way that I wanted to create it so that people can really, you know, uh, go in very, very, like they can go from very basic steps to learn Rhino, then start to increase the complexity of the lessons. And um, creating all of this was a big challenge because uh, it wasn't just about filming. It was also about, you know, we talked this previously um, about deciding, okay, what type of recording setup I need to have, what types of microphones I need to have, what is the audio, how do you edit the audio, how do you edit a video, how do you, where do you put these videos, uh, how do you host them, how do you connect them with your website, uh, where do you put the files and all of this um, uh, elements, which plugins do you need to integrate all of this, how do you, how do you automate a lot of a lot of uh, this, you know, manual labor. And at the beginning, it was all manual. I was doing it all manually. And then slowly as the platform progressed, I, I introduced a lot of, you know, automatic software that can help with all of that. It's like the classic uh, <laughs> startup story. I'm also very passionate about, uh, um, for person I'm interested about marketing, about um communication i mean everything yeah what is this podcast about is communicating with people and communicating to people and you mentioned you started reading about these topics and about uh, finance and you took some classes to learn certain things um could you share like one uh, not one could you share some books or something uh, some tutorials or something that was really helpful for you that really sticked with you and Im impressed you somehow? Yeah. So in terms of, you know, in terms of the, um, the marketing, uh, I would connect marketing and business because they're quite, you know, similar. Um, so in terms of the marketing, I would definitely recommend, uh, Jeff Walker. Uh, he is, uh, one of the most famous marketers in the world and he created so-called, uh, Jeff Walker formula that that you're currently using on on our website and definitely check that that out and in terms of the business i would recommend uh my my business mentor uh, sam ovens who is uh whose course course uh, i took and i really got a lot of um, value in terms of how do you run a business how do you think about hiring how you think about marketing about sales about you know everything that that is connected because running a business is very um, challenging because you just you you need to worry about many different things at the same time sometimes like if you have sales on one side you have uh, your product on the other side you have your customers you have also potential customers you have advertising all of these areas need to kind of work together if you want to grow the business and if you want to scale the business and um, his training really opened my eyes in terms of what is possible and what what I can do because the like the number one skill in my opinion is is um, is sales that you need to have if you want to expand the business. Just like you said, it's about talking with people. It's about connecting with people. It's about speaking the language that they understand. It's not the same as if I'm talking with somebody who's not in architecture because they speak different language. And it's really important to kind of hit that pain point of what people are feeling and then uh, showing them that that problem can be solved. And that's pretty much, you know, what I would recommend those two guys. And this some Sam Ovens, he has like an online class or something like that? He has a very good free YouTube channel that you can check out on, on YouTube. And he also has uh, a course uh, that is uh, that is available on his website called consulting.com. Mm -hmm. Okay. Th those those are but but you have a lot of free stuff on YouTube, which is very valuable. You just need to go through all of this, and like the course is going to really help you out with your mindset, with your you know business perspective, and all of the bits and pieces of what it goes into one. Um, but yeah, definitely that helped me personally a lot to develop my my skills and to see uh, to really open my eyes of what is possible and you know what what we can achieve. Great. 
I will give it a check for sure. It's um, always interesting to to check uh, these um, different sources and um, and to to get to know who uses what to to get yeah. there uh, to achieve what their goals are. And what was the um, role of Lazar, your your partner? That also, it's to be yeah. seen on the website. Yeah, Lazar. Lazar joined me um, in two thousand. Uh, 19 he was he was working in in china prior to that and uh he came back to serbia and he wanted to i i asked him do you do you want to join me do you want to do to be uh, you know special uh, specialized just for grasshopper because he uh he's been really good with grasshopper he's much better than me in grasshopper and his uh his expertise is really something that i think uh would help a lot of people especially in this field because uh, we we all know that parametric architecture, you know, is the future, and a lot of people are all talking about it. Um, and I thought that it was a perfect match between all of the knowledge and experience that I had with Rhino and Rhino plugins, and his experience with Grasshopper. And you know, he thought about it. We joined forces, and since then we're doing all of these tutorials on YouTube uh, together, and we're creating the whole platform, you know, together. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's that. That's and then we also have one um, uh, one employee right now who's working for us, and she's helping us with all of the you know administration and consulting and acquiring new clients. And I think lately you have been also looking for someone to help you with content creator or something like that, social media. Yeah, we had last year. Uh, we were asking for somebody who can. Uh, help us with um, with the writing because we wanted to improve our uh, SEO visibility of our website. So we wanted to create a lot of topics on um, on architecture in general for our blog, and that's where we uh, were searching for writers to help us with that. And uh, recently, we were asking for uh, somebody to help us with uh, the design of our Instagram because. Our focus is on YouTube. So our Instagram is not something where we put a lot of effort in. We just publish something that is connected to the tutorial that we publish on YouTube. Uh, but we realized that we can also um, get a lot of from Instagram followers. And that's why we, we decided to um, to dedicate somebody, to dedicate a person only for designing posts and, and creating content on Instagram. And yeah, we found somebody. And, and so, so from now on, we're going to have more interesting content on, on Instagram, we hope. I'm looking forward to see how it's gonna uh, change and develop. And uh, but to to come to go back to the first steps. So uh, I mean, probably you're more aware than me that the you know in the startup method you start with the MVP, this minimal viable product. You get feedback and then you improve you iterate. it. Yeah, you yeah. reiterate. Um, what was what was the first uh, version of uh, How to Rhino, and what were the iterations to get to yeah. this this point where we are? Uh, it was very bad at the beginning, uh, and when I when I started, you know, I realized that I at the beginning I'm not gonna have the best tutorials, I'm not gonna have the best equipment, I'm not gonna have the best anything, but I need to start. So at the beginning I was like, okay, let's just find the software to record. I found that. Let's find a microphone to record. I found that. And then, you know, first initial tutorials were very, uh, I would say, um, uh, low quality. They, they were not low quality in, in the sense that the material was bad, but uh, low, very bad sound, very bad, you know, recording uh, um, uh, quality. And uh, then slowly I realized, okay, I need to produce content because producing content will bring more people to the platform. So I said to myself, okay, it doesn't matter how bad it is. I'm going to continue doing it because um, when you do something for a long time, you know, naturally people come. So uh, at, at one point I said, okay, now I have, you know, everything. I, I wanted to improve the next tutorial for a little bit, right? So since that point, let's say, I would say um, starting 2019, uh, middle of 2019, when we had that first initial uh, workshop that's when I said okay now I have very basic website uh, the, the website was, was very basic it was very like ugly uh, and I was I was aware that it was ugly but I, I I just said okay I have certain amount of hours in my day that I can dedicate to this 
So I, I cannot copy myself, you know, so some things are, need to suffer at the beginning until, until we get this going. And uh, slowly, you know, uh, when Lazar joined, um, we talked about improving the website and that's where we, where we, when we changed a little bit our graphics on the website and on the whole structure of the website. That's when we started doing um, uh, SEO and that's when we started doing better tutorials, more high quality tutorials. Uh, and that, that, that was the change pretty much when Lazar joined, joined that's when we started to create more uh, better content because I had more time to spend my time on all these aspects, right? Because when, you, when you're the one who's creating three tutorials per week, you really don't have anything else to do, right? Because you don't have time. And creating three tutorials per week was really, um, really difficult at the beginning, but that was my goal initially to produce as much, as many tutorials as possible. And then later on, uh, that switched to two tutorials per week. Then it came down to one tutorial per week. And right now, since we're creating uh, since we're creating a new course that will come out uh, late, uh, later uh, this year, uh, we really don't have enough time to create tutorials at all. So we create maybe one tutorial in, in two weeks and so on. Uh, but this, these are also some of the decisions that we need, needed to make in order to, you know, kind of uh, think about the business, think about the organic growth and kind of evaluate what is the best approach there. So, uh, so currently, you know, we're doing around, uh, one tutorial for every like 10 days or so, but we try to make, you know, every single tutorial a little bit more interesting. And we, we also try to do a couple of different things with different uh, formats of, of YouTube tutorials. Um, and we're, we're kind of seeing what the feedback is and iterate again on that. Uh, so an interesting thing is that um, one of our tutorials, which is not really connected with Rhino so much, is um, which laptops to use in architecture for 2021. That video blow, like blew up and it was just me sharing what is my workstation laptop and what I would recommend for people, you know. And that was kind of a sign for us to see, okay, maybe our, our, our audience is not just Rhino audience, maybe it's also architectural students with different, you know, uh, different desires and different needs. So maybe we can help them in that area as well. And that's how you iterate when you get a feedback, right? And I, this is one, one very good example. I think one thing that um, sort of distinguish your platform is that also the first time when I checked the um, tutorials on YouTube in order to see what was it all mm -hmm. about is that you have created this particular branding for for your platform that shows Rhino in a more sexy way than usually because uh, the more the most used softwares for cool things that looks really cool are 3ds Max or Cinema 4D yeah. and then yeah Rhino it's more for the modeling part but in in your case it's also the branding and the particular graphics that you use it's very specific and it's very cool. And the other thing that for for me works a lot, uh, I mean, I haven't, I haven't, I know about that video with the laptop, but I haven't watched it because I have a laptop right now. I'm happy with. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, but um, the tutorials are short. They're based on something really famous that everybody knows, and that usually architecture students or architects likes, and it teaches you in a very simple iteration of uh, steps. To rebuild it in Rhino and it's it's quick and, and easy so to say so that um, yeah it looks easy it looks easy it looks <laughs> yeah I mean it's easy now that you have had so many years behind uh, sure, sure. on your shoulders sure. to to show it that easy but that's what and uh, as I so also personally I'm in one example that once you take the the classes um, you're happy with the experience so that you. Uh, as I said, I feel I, I like to share about your platform because I liked it personally, if uh, that, that's my personal opinion. But uh, yeah, I think this is a very good strength in, um, in, in your platform. And um, could, you, could you share or is it still sort of um, a secret what is going to be the next course class about? 
Yeah. So, so b- before I answer that question for the for the course, I uh, just want to mention a little bit about YouTube before. So, you know, creating YouTube is YouTube tutorials and YouTube content is is very um, specific to your to your audience, right? So, creating those tutorials, which are short and sweet, is good. But at the beginning, I didn't know this, and I didn't know how that I needed to optimize my titles, my thumbnails, my, like, it's just like a learning curve. If you're learning any other skill, like how to create YouTube video, it's not that simple because at the beginning I was just producing, producing, producing just to have a lot of clips, but then I said, okay, how do we, you know, grow this to like, to be, you know, faster and and bigger. And that's when I started reading about YouTube as well and YouTube YouTube algorithm. And uh, the main two things that are the most important when it comes to YouTube is retention rate and uh, click-through rate. Retention rate is how much uh, time is is watched in a video. Is it like like 15%, 50% or, or 100% of your video? The more it is, the better uh, feedback you will get from YouTube algorithm and they will promote your video uh, you know, to, to the very big audience. And the second one is a click-through rate. How many people actually click on your video? So these two things were like the lesson that, that, that we learned through a lot of iteration and um, choosing also the, the new, new topics, new projects. It's always like, we're still not dialed in completely. We still don't know how something will perform. It's really always, sh- sh- will it go to 10, 10K? Will it go to 5K? Like what is, what is the amount of views we can expect? But, you know, more or less we know for us what works, what doesn't work. And then we try to kind of go in that direction. Uh, and then to connect on the question about the course, um, yes, we're we're developing um, we're developing uh, two courses. Uh, one course is being in development for over a year now. Uh, it's going to be a big grasshopper complete course. That's we think that's how it's going to be called. Uh, where we're going to cover all of the commands and all of the things that you need to know in Grasshopper. That's going to take you from complete beginner to the advanced user. So the one that we have right now is only a part of our course, which is called Grasshopper Essentials. We do just teaching you the basics of Grasshopper. And in this big course, it's going to have uh, the same amount of content that the whole platform has now. So it's like, you know, around 60, 70 hours of video material of just Grasshopper showing you all of the components, all of the things, all of the connections, all of the tips and tricks and creating around 10 different uh, complex products in Grasshopper. And this is going to be the next the next um, course for us. Uh, we also have another one uh, that is almost ready. Uh, that's going to be about Rhino Inside Revit. Uh, you probably heard about Rhino Inside Revit. It's really this uh, huge... A new plugin for Revit that allows you to connect Grasshopper with Revit, and it's really gonna make a change, I think, um, in 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 current uh, workflows that offices around the world are using, uh, because it's really connecting that design phase of the project with parametric uh, design with Grasshopper, and then pushing that Revit seamlessly, without the need to kind of transfer geometry and uh, without the need to rebuild everything in Revit. And um, this is the next the next um, part of the course that we're, we're going to be publishing. And I can tell you more or less that this is going to be in around two months or so. We'll have a big a big workshop prior to that launch, and then you will be able to see you know what is possible with Ryan inside Revit and Grasshopper. And um, one thing that I'm also curious about is uh, I always ask this for to everyone that comes on the podcast is uh, when I hear the story it sounds really nice <laughs> but of course you can understand from the conversation that there was a lot of work on it and behind it and another thing that I'm always very curious what was the cr- growth curve and the growth um, the, the sp- span time you needed to like from the moment you started doing these tutorials to to lift off because now you have over 60,000 people following you on YouTube and then the the videos are quite successful uh but what was the the time it was needed for you to to 
to grow and this audience and was there a tipping point where you saw okay this is was the moment from which the like curve went very yeah. much steep up yeah uh i think that happened like be before i answer um you know building something uh like this requires a lot of planning and a lot of uh dedication and you need to understand that it's not going to be overnight and it, it requires time it requires a lot of energy and it requires a lot of risk because at the end of the day you're putting a lot of your time and energy into something that may work may does may not work right so it's it's about being okay even if it doesn't work and then realizing yeah i did, I, i wanted to do this because you know i saw the potential i saw that there's something uh, in here that i can help uh, with and that i can help a lot of people and it was around i would say a year and a couple of months in into this uh when i saw that a lot of people were replying to 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 the videos on youtube and to my emails and they were thanking me for doing this they were thanking me for sharing this knowledge and they were really grateful for uh this kind of uh platform right and that's when you get an email like that it kind of gives back all of the effort and, and energy that you, that you that you put into it uh so i was when i started receiving those emails that's when i decided okay yeah this is working and this is working because i i get a lot of these messages right it's not just like a two messages it's it's a lot of comments of people who say that this helped them to finish their project to get a better job to get a better portfolio a lot of people were were sharing their projects with me um uh and i would say you one year and let's say 3 4 months since i saw that it really started to grow and then when i took that course that i told you about from sam owens that's when i realized that if i want to scale this i need to have some additional skills and that's when i learned how to sell and you know how to talk with people on on the phone and on zoom and that's when you have this skill you can really be like unstoppable in terms of scaling anything uh it's just a matter of that's new territory for me and uh it's a new challenge and i usually always wanted to take take new challenges on so that was just like when I, when i got that skill to the to the place where okay i'm good now that's that's when i saw okay this is this is going to work uh and it took around one one year and a half so far i see so you have uh which year did you start uh like one and a half year ago or or yeah no no it was the 2018 in may something like this so and so i would yeah i would say 2000 and 2000 like 2019 the end of the year and 2020 the beginning of the year yeah so and then yeah i totally can relate that you have to do stuff and uh play the long term and then um improve also notice be self critical and um yeah as you said there learn 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 from a lot of like learn from mistakes definitely try to not just learn from your mistakes but from mistakes of other people i was very stubborn when i was younger i thought i knew everything but then i stumbled a couple of times and that's that's when you kind of okay you're not the smartest one there's smarter people than you so having somebody who's who's done what you what you want to do is really helpful and really helps to cut down the time to get there and that's the lesson i, I would i would like to to give everybody you know try to learn from more experienced people and don't be super you know with a super big ego like you know everything you don't know everything yeah i think this is also i don't know if you can relate to this but i <laughs> feel like also in our culture of the geographical a geographical area it's more like i don't need help <laughs> i can do it sure. myself yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh this is why would why, why would i why would i pay you when i can do it myself for free i i i had um i had on the podcast uh, these guys they have uh, started a platform it's called out of architecture uh there are mm -hmm. two harvard architectural graduate that uh kind of have re re 
set up themselves in a different position. One works at Adidas, I think, and the others has some sort of creative studio. And they do consultancy to switch career. I said, if this was Bulgaria, you just suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Your platform wouldn't work there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, one thing also that I'm um, really curious is um, doing something like this takes a lot of time. And the big problem in the beginning of starting something like this is that uh, you cannot put hundred percent of your time in something that doesn't bring any income because you still have to pay the bills um mm -hmm. so what was also the initial setup like did you still um like what was your income generation yeah. while building up the whole thing yeah we, we talked briefly about this uh, at the beginning so um you cannot do this the way that I did it, if you don't have a second source of income, because building this require required like almost 95% of the energy and a lot of motivation. Right. So, um, at the beginning I was still freelancing and I was, I was, you know, lucky enough to build my profile on Upwork very, very well. And I had a lot of clients, international clients, uh, that I still work with and, that's how I pretty much managed to to pull it off because I was I was doing freelancing uh, full time. I mean full time, not full time, but you know you know how it is in freelancing. Sometimes you have things to do, sometimes you don't have at all. So I was trying to kind of see, okay, what is the minimum amount of money I need for for this month to be on zero? And as soon as I earned that money, let's say in the first week, then I would say, okay, I'm good for this month. I will spend all of this time just for uh, tutorials. And then when the next month starts, then I would accept the second job. And that's, that's how I just wanted to be at least on, on zero. But of course with freelancing, you know, sometimes you cannot, um, you cannot just, you know, um, reject jobs when they, when they come. So sometimes, uh, I even had to outsource some of my freelancing work to somebody else. And uh, that was that was also something that at the beginning helped me out. But when you realize that, you know, you I was I was doing Rhino at the same time I was teaching Rhino and I was doing Rhino. So for me it was kind of the same. You know, it was the same energy. It was just you know I'm doing this for money and then I'm doing this for you know for for to, to grow the business to grow the platform. So uh, that was my initial setup. And later on, uh, we opened. Um, we opened a, a so-called uh, Patreon, which is like a page where people can donate uh, money and they can be a part of your of your inner circle and they can get, for example, uh, project files from the tutorials that you do and they have access to some extended tutorials. And Patreon really helped us to, at the beginning, to, to be on zero because we also had a lot of um, additional software that we're using to, like there was, there's monthly costs for running a business. Like you need to pay the software for, for the email. You need to pay the software for, uh, for the platform, for everything, all of this. So once, once everything was covered fully by Patreon supporters, then I stopped doing freelancing and then said, okay, now we are self-sufficient business, meaning that we're never going to be in, in minus because, uh, the Patreon members are, you know, paying, paying for, for um for keeping us alive and then um after that when the courses started selling then uh the curve of of you know income was just growing and growing yes uh, that sounds like a small way to do it and uh, another thing that i wanted to ask you is that if you have had this vision um since the beginning because of how it is turned out today because one thing that a lot of, um, I feel this is across all design fields, is um, also because of the way you get educated, is that um, you are working in a service business. So you do, yes. you have your time and you spend your time to create one single outcome that it's then mm -hmm. being sold. So. The problem with this kind of service is that you have 24 hours a day and you still have eight where you should be sleeping and then maybe eight where you should do something else. 
in an aid where you have to work and um and it's not scalable you cannot uh, you can maybe outsource something but then yeah again um and what i really like about the platform is that it's exactly this hybrid situation where i don't have to um come on a certain time online where you are maybe there and you'll then share your screen and you'll teach me what to do but there is this platform where you get in there are these modules there are these exercises and then there are certain way like if you have questions you can submit the questions via email and then you send back a video and then all these videos are shared or if it's something bigger you can book a video call for an hour or so yeah. and then go together through a topic and then some people might at first i think oh this is lazy but for me it wasn't lazy it was f for my personal setup how my life is going on it was perfect because it's like uh going to those 24-hour gyms you know you can decide when to go to train sure. you don't have to show up at a certain time <laughs> and that's also you know the downside is that everyone has to discipline themselves to to do the the exercises but was yeah. that the vi the vision for you to create also something that it's not um always taking sucking up your time because people of course it's not and also it, i don't want it to sound like you don't do anything because i guess that every time they come these questions you have to do the videos and that's also work uh but um was it a vision for you to create sort of this more scalable setup yeah 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 very good question so so this comes down to um you know the initial goal and uh the initial you know sets of of ideas that i had at the beginning uh and that was to create something that um where i don't need to put all my time in and that can be sold multiple times and that i can multiply my income a lot in a very short amount of time right so uh, that's when I start exploring all of these like business ideas. And just like you said, uh, when you have a service-based business, you're exchanging your time for money. When you're when you're working for some company, you're exchanging your time for money. What if you can exchange your time for money, but many many times, right? Not just one, not just like one hour a day. Imagine if you can multiply it. So, having a product. That is digital. That, that is digital product that can be resold many, many times, and people get the same value from it as if you would be doing this one on one with them. Is something that uh, that I learned uh, from some audience from this guy, and like he really talked about this: how to scale the business, how to really go from doing something one on one to doing something completely like uh, independently like to to be able to sell something multiple times and what we created with the course initially it was it was uh, a workshop uh, that was live workshop but then i realized that just like you said a lot of people a lot of architects have a lot of things to do a lot of different time zones they have their obligations and it's very difficult to put them all together in the same you know zoom room at the same time and um, it was all based on the feedback from that I got from people. They said that they wanted to be able to uh, uh, to come in on the platform whenever they wanted, and that's that's what what happened afterwards, right? So it's very it's very interesting that you need to kind of listen to what your initial customers are saying because that will shape how your product will look like in the future, and that's what happened in this case. And um, we try to also have something unique about us. Because if you're just selling the course, okay, uh, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people selling the course on Udemy and on other platforms. Like, what's different about you? So the, the different the different thing about us is that we're really focused and really um, we put all of our effort into helping the students to get to that to that goal as soon as possible. And that's why we wanted to have personal you know connection with them. That's why we have this kind of hybrid system, just like you said, where uh, whenever you need help, you can ask us, we can help you out. Whenever you need one-on-one -on -one consultations, we can also talk about that. And you choose your own time, you choose your own schedule. On one side, just like you said, it's very difficult to kind of um, you know, motivate people to go through this because it's it's about personal, you know, personal goals for them because not everybody wants to learn Rhino 
you know, in, in one month, somebody wants to learn it in three months, somebody in one week. So based on that, people kind of need to push themselves. And what we do, we try to be really observant and asking them occasionally, Hey, how's it going? Do you need any kind of help? We try to push them, but, uh, in the future, we're going to tr try to create some, um, for our uh, next course. That's also something new. We're going to be publishing our course on a different platform that has some of these aspects of gamification, which means that you can kind of compete with other students to, to get to the next lesson, to get some points. So we hope that this will actually improve that problem where people don't finish the course uh, at the end. Yeah. No, and I think also one great thing about this setup is that you sing down the costs because all the other workshops that you can follow, um, they require an extremely intense commitment uh, financially uh, with time and also for example like you mentioned in the archivist world realm there are different sort of academies you can uh, yeah. can go to uh, and which means they cost several thousand euros um, and you have to travel to the place where they are be there one month which means if you're working person you have to whether take holidays mm -hmm. or get one month off without being paid or quit your job and then you have to also travel to there live there it's very very complicated you have to really invest and at the end of the day i don't know you enter another competitive field where you don't know um, and this is something that i really really like that you have created this for I don't know. I th I think anyone could join it, but especially it's very helpful for people like like me that works be, that already work. Because um, if you're a student, it's easier. Maybe you have less commitments, and it's the time of your life where you really focus only on that. Um, and another thing that I was curious and I was really happy to see in your platform is that, of course, you're based in Serbia, and but you work on the global market. And um, yeah. when you started the whole idea and developing it, did you share the idea with some of your uh, maybe friends or so that are in the same field? And I'm curious, what was their reaction? Were they rather, oh, this is really cool, it's supportive or do some, Lucian, what the fuck yeah. are you doing? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that was actually a very good question because um, I'm coming back for, to, again to this guy, Sam Owens, because in his course, he mentions, okay, send an email to like, let's say five of your best friends or five, you know, like, let's say member of your family, your best friend, uh, somebody like you don't know that well and try to, to ask them, uh, what is your, what are your, your, your biggest strengths and what, what are the things that they see you in the future? Like how did they see you? Right. And it's very interesting when you get back the, the you know, the answers from, from your friends. And if you see that something is connecting, connecting, that means, okay, these people know you and they've known you for all your life. And uh, it, it's not a coincidence that things repeat, right? So one of these elements was uh, that I will be like a businessman, right? So I'm not, I'm not going to be a famous architect, but I'm going to be something in business, right? So I was like, okay, yeah, that, that, that's right. And this is, this is like the initial, uh, the initial start of, uh, you know, the idea of how, how I should develop this. And, uh, it's really interesting to, uh, to get idea of what is, uh, the thing that you know, that can help other people. Is there a product market fit and is, is it a good time for this or not? Right. And all of these things, you know, collect for me at that point and I realized, okay, this is something I like to do. I enjoy doing, I enjoy teaching as well. And, you know, that, that, that's how it all started at the beginning. Yeah. And I've heard about this exercise also from, from other, from other people. And I think it's always like, especially when you do something this simple, it sounds really cheesy in the beginning and you feel yes, very, it does, it does. you feel really uncomfortable. Like uh, the first reaction is, uh, I'm not going to yeah. do that. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. So give me a break. Like I don't need to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, totally. And what is your current uh, working day look like for the people? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is gonna sound very weird. Um, I don't have a working day. I like all of my days are pretty much working days, so I don't take days off at all. Like maybe just like occasionally when I want to go and to relax a little bit, like I like to go, for example, snowboarding and uh, I take a couple of days off. So I take the days off when I really need them. Uh, but when I have some kind of goal that I need to get to the project that I'm currently working on, um, I, I put myself in, in that mode, like this needs to get done. And of course I don't work all day, but I try to put, you know, at least, uh, you know, let's say, 10 to 12 hours a day to work on something that is gonna, you know, get us to the next step. Currently that's editing videos for the course. And it's very, you know, it's very like boring, but it's the things that, you know, you need to get done. And uh, I really found that having, um, having a nice, like a morning routine for me that, that really helps, you know, but, you know, doing, for example, meditation in the morning, uh, waking up early, uh, going on um, on uh, CrossFit, I'm, I'm I'm going on CrossFit with with Lazar as well. So pretty much, I'm you know I'm working and then I'm training and that's that's it. And I spend time again, you know, free time whenever I I feel like I want to do it. Yeah, and um, what was the um, initial um, the initial working day? Did you need to? put because for example one problem that i personally have is that when something it's new and needs to be uh, i read this um, analogy you know like those kids um kids playgrounds have this uh it's like a, a spinning spinning uh, game for kids where they sit and they can spin themselves and then things mm -hmm. spins and 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 then um <laughs> getting into spin mode it's really hard it requires a lot of energy but one is spinning quite quickly you cannot, yeah you yeah, need a little push and scary. then it keeps spinning uh, <laughs> so uh, in order to 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 get the whole thing spinning how was the um the initial times where you pushing it more like than than usually like uh yeah yeah, initially at the beginning it was it was I would say more intense uh, because at the beginning I didn't have any kind of like at the beginning it was more chasing like trying to get to that to that point where I can see if this is gonna work right and that's when I wanted this this point to be very short you know I wanted this to be less than one year and and a half but uh, that's that's how long it took at the beginning I was really really uh, trying to. Uh, produce as much content as possible. I was posting on all of the social media channels, uh, and I was alone. I Lazar wasn't with with me then, and then when Lazar came, it was much easier because we could kind of uh, you know split the the chores and split the uh, the work, and that was really a, a big relief for me personally. And uh, right now, I would say it's not as intense as it was before then. Uh, but there's always things you need to kind of think about in the future. There's always things you need to plan in the future. There's always um, there's always things you need to kind of uh, think about. For example, I had to learn things about accounting, about book bookkeeping, about like keeping the money, opening the business in Serbia here. That's also something that required a lot of energy and required a lot of uh, effort to straight all of this out. And now. I can say that we're kind of, you know, um, on the solid ground and now it's just about, okay, what is the next step? Where do we go from here and how do we scale this up? Because if you don't innovate, if you just, if you're just stagnant in the business, somebody else is going to take over. Yeah. So you need to keep, keep going. You need to have the drive. You cannot lose the drive. Uh, you know, it, it's all about what is your North star? What, what is your biggest goal? Like why, why are you doing this in the first place? Right. So that's, that's for me, that's kind of like the, um, the energy that you were talking about. And, um, well, I think we, we've covered most of the topics, uh, 
I, I always like to say that uh, the podcast is one and a half hour, more or less long, but you can always go for on and on and on. Uh, I don't. Yeah, there's an endless amount of topics we can talk about. Endless amount of topics, um, but I want I don't want to 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 take away um any more of your time and i want to maybe keep some of the topics for the next time when you come back because sure. uh, all the guests are always welcome back uh because uh, i feel like uh um i want i like i consider all the guests like some people that have helped me just by by accepting to talk to me and uh if the platform gets bigger and very popular i want to give back by giving them again the stage um awesome I always want to conclude the whole thing in a positive note, even more positive than we have had. Um, and um, we're creating this sort of uh, deck of inspiration, I like to call it, uh, where everybody shares um, um, what inspires them, a book, a movie or a podcast or any kind of uh, media. So what is the case for you if you can share something? Yeah, so... Uh, what personally inspires me um, at the moment and in the previous years was uh, the exploration of unknown space and particularly, you know, outer space, um, going back to SpaceX and what they're doing with, you know, the development of uh, Starship. I'm not sure if you're familiar with all of this, but we're actually growing and, and trying to colonize other planets and uh, colonize Mars and then Moon and so on. So I found a lot of inspiration you know, in in what these people are doing in in all of this you know workforce that is required to to build the rocket that would take humanity to another planet, and that just open uh, opens up a lot of possibilities for us as well as architects and to kind of think what is the future going to look like in space and uh, what are the future buildings going to look like and I really found find inspiration in sci-fi movies and sci-fi content. Uh, in also, you know, thinking about what it would be like to live in, let's say, 200 years from now in the future. Like, would we be still, uh, you know, biological, you know, beings or would we integrate with machines and what would all that look like? So I really like to find inspirations in, in this kind of like topics of, of what the future would look like and how we can, as a, as, as a, spe as a species, uh, help to to get the human to, the, to that stage and to really be inspiring our future generations so that that's what i would i would say in in, in that um, regard and maybe i would recommend one book that personally helped me you know the most in my personal you know uh, growth personal and business growth and that would be uh the book from uh, gary keller and uh, jay uh, popson that, that is called the one thing and this is this is the book that I recommend everybody to read. I gift this book a lot to other people uh, because it's the truest book that, you know, it really helped me to shape my, my, my current situation in my life. And it was really that first line in the book that said, you know, if you have two paths, if you go in each path equally, you will never get your goal. You need to choose one path and need to go all in. And this is what I did. And it turned out great. So I always, you know, um, of course, it's not just that easy, but there's a lot of, you know, roadblocks along the way, but that's something that uh, inspired me a lot. Yeah, and it's inspiring to see the results. So thank you very much, Dusan. Before we conclude, you can share where people can can find uh, more. I'll put all the links, of course, in the in the description of the of the podcast, um, so that. Um, people can find it easy just by clicking, uh, but you can share yourself where can people get in touch with you? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, you just need to go to howtorhino.com. Uh, that's where you will find all of the information, all of the things about our uh, free training, about our courses, about our YouTube channel, about the blog posts, about architecture. Feel free to uh, to schedule a free call with us if you want to talk about the course, and we'll you know share the platform with you and get to know get to know you a little bit and see if we can help you out. And yeah, that that bit. Thank you very much, and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you as well, man. All the best. Bye bye. bye. bye.